Thank you for joining us for our Medical Reserve Corps Volunteer Orientation. I'm Jennifer Freeland, the State Volunteer Coordinator at the Office of Emergency Preparedness at the Virginia Department of Health. You are here because you have completed an application with us. Congratulations. Your second step is to go through this orientation, and at the same time, your MRC unit coordinator will probably be con uh, conducting a background investigation. After this training, you will be able to take more training after you've completed the orientation. We'll be assigning you to a team and then working on the deployment process. So here's what we're gonna talk about right now. We want you to understand the purpose and the mission of the MRC. Our overview of public health and specifically our response related to COVID-19. You'll understand your role and policies and responsibilities, protocols um, regarding your deployment as a Medical Reserve Corps volunteer. And we want you to understand both the Virginia Volunteer Health System and our training system, Virginia Train. We'll then talk about the next steps to move forward and your steps to become a Medical Reserve Corps volunteer. So our program started after 9-11. There were so many people in the community that really wanted to help, much like yourself for this COVID-19 response. But at the time, there was no Medical Reserve Corps program or process to be able to deploy anyone interested in serving in a public health or medical capacity. The federal government created the Emergency System for the Advanced Registration of Volunteer Health Professionals. In Virginia, we call that the Virginia Volunteer Health System. The program that we use to manage all the wonderful volunteers that support public health and emergency response is the national program is in the national program and it's housed in the Department of Health and Human Services and the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in the Office of Emergency Management. In Virginia, our program is an entity of the Virginia Department of Health. It's sponsored by our Office of Emergency Preparedness and is housed in each local health district and serves the local health districts. Some of the units are regional units. In Virginia, we have received multiple funding resources to be able to support our program. Different from a Red Cross or a nonprofit organization, we are fortunate that we do not have to do fundraising to support our program. It is 100% funded by local and state and federal resources. Our mission is to engage you as community members, and we want you to be prepared to support ongoing public health initiatives and emergencies throughout the localities in Virginia. We say we're volunteers protecting Virginia's health in many ways. Now in this presentation, I am not gonna have the time to go through all of the long list of things that volunteers do for public health initiatives, because we're gonna fo focus specifically on COVID-19. As you become a more active volunteer in your unit, you'll learn about the great things that volunteers do do. Here's your first very important homework. We need you to know who your coordinator is. What we have on the um, map here are MRC units, and they're broken down by healthcare coalition regions. Now, we as MRC volunteers and our MRC units do not work independently. We are integrated into our public health um, regions and into our healthcare coalition. We are a part of a much larger team. So out in the southwestern part of the state, we have the Southwest Virginia MRC with Christina Morris, um, near southwest with Mary Lou, um, northwest is Chris. Moving up north north, we have Loudon and um, Loudon is Francis and Fairfax is Paula, Arlington is Christina, Alexandra is Ionella. Uh, Prince William is Amy, and Rappahannock and Rappahannock Rapidan is Jessica, Henrico and Chickahominy, Alyssa, Three Rivers, Johanna, Eastern Shore, Ellen, Peninsula, Olivia, Norfolk, Summer, Portsmouth, Terry, Virginia Beach, Ellen Burgess, um, Chesapeake's Tom, Western Tidewater is Connor, um, Richmond City is Kate Bossman, and actually Augustine Doe is filling in and Chesterfield and Brenda Fender is filling in in South Central. So we do have a very robust team of 22 Medical Reserve Corps units. This is not the first time that the Medical Reserve Corps has responded to a public health emergency. One of our biggest responses was during the H1N1 pandemic. We used 
nearly 2,000 volunteers to support over 700 volunteer activities, and the monetary value of their time was over $825,000. I certainly expect that we will probably double that for our COVID-19 response efforts. Volunteers have assisted us with um, Ebola response, really did a lot of outreach and education for Zika, and continuously support our opioid and addiction um, it has been a declared public health emergency. Our volunteers teach revive training, which teaches community members how to use Narcan to reverse an overdose. Um, we also dispense Narcan and do a lot of education out in the communities. For public health and emergencies, the health department has four specific functions that we are responsible for. We coordinate medical, public health, mental health, and emergency medical services. We do not provide all of those services as the health department, but we do coordinate them. Of course, that healthcare coalition helps us to coordinate the larger medical aspects of with our hospitals and health systems. VDH is responsible for public health. Our mental health is Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. And each of our EMS councils really provide the services of emergency medical and transport. Although the Office of Emergency Preparedness Leadership is within the Virginia Department of Health. We conduct active disease surveillance and investigations. This happens every day and also much more in emergencies as you can imagine with COVID-19. But even with COVID-19 today, we have a hepatitis outbreak in the communities. We'll have flu. There will be a lot of diseases that we'll be um, surveilling during the fall. So um, our epidemiologists are very busy and they're doing absolute fantastic job um, in this effort for COVID-19. We established procedures for mass vaccination of um, community members and the distribution of um, medication if it's needed. Specifically, this capability was originally focused for anthrax response, the ability to provide Cipro or Doxy within a 24 to 48 um, time frame. But we are using this training and this capability to support our COVID-19 response efforts. We also support mass care and shelter operations, the specific medical needs for that. So when we set up community shelters for a hurricane or a winter storm, our volunteers are providing the medical and special needs aspect of that shelter. We don't set up the shelter or man and set up the cot, um, but we have help to provide the volunteers that do first aid and monitor the public health needs of that facility during the emergency. We'll now take a little bit of a step back in time of COVID-19. Um, so we had our first detected case in China in December of last year. Our first case in Virginia was in March 7th, um, declared a pandemic not far after that. Um, our governor declared a state of emergency. Then we entered into the stay home order on March 30th. Actually, today is May 15th, and many people are very excited because it is the first day of our phase one of reopening in certain areas of the state. I'm not a medical professional, so I'm not going to, during this orientation, give you um, a true uh, medical um, diagnosis and description of COVID-19, but the best place for resources regarding Virginia's COVID-19 response and our current numbers in hospitals and long-term care facilities and um, testing, all of that is on our website. So I really encourage you to take the time to look at our website regularly. So what are we doing as a community to help prevent the, the spread of COVID-19. Well, with any disease, we always encourage everyone to wash your hands. It's so incredibly important to do this before or after leaving your house, before and after uh, eating. Um, just more you can wash your hands, the better off that we will all be. We do have some great educational materials that many of our volunteers have used in the past. I imagine that once we continue with the reopening phase, we'll be doing outreach. Um, we have some glow germ kits that 
volunteers will often use to teach people about how to properly wash um, their hands. Of course, although we're even reopening, we still want to practice good social distancing. In addition to staying six feet apart or staying home if possible to stay safe, um, it is recommended that community members wear masks when we're unable to maintain the six foot social distancing. I hope you've had some time at home and enjoyed uh, your time at home um, where I stay at work order. Certainly um, my backyard and everybody's yards are looking a lot better because people have been uh, using their extra energy outside and taking care of their properties. But hopefully you've also been taking care of your neighbors, specifically those that are high risk. Of course, there are um, individuals that are 65 and older that have lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, um, or undergoing cancer treatment. If you have one of those neighbors and perhaps they live at home, I hope you've been checking on them, making sure they have food or any necessary supplies and medication, um, and that you're also checking on your own family members that are at risk. And, you know, sometimes they may not be as compliant with our stay-at-home um, orders or wearing a mask. We hope that you can encourage them to do so. Let's look now at our photo album. I like to be able to share all the pictures of volunteers of the activities we have done thus far for COVID-19. Very early on, at the end of February, um, our volunteers started to staff our public health call centers. This is a picture here at the beginning of our volunteers in Alexandria staffing a call center. That call center was able to answer, is able, and currently does answer, Question, uh, questions from the community, provides referrals from um, healthcare providers and answers guidance and questions. Today, um, that call center looks a little different. Um, they're maintaining with six feet. Um, there's lots more hand sanitizer and wipes down on tables. And we are very fortunate that we actually have hundreds of volunteers that have signed up to be on our call center team. Also volunteers, in addition to doing the larger call center, volunteers have been working and responding to um, healthcare professionals. This here is a wonderful gentleman who is a retired physician, and he was able to make calls um, back to physicians. We have volunteers that are healthcare volunteers that are checking in with long-term care facilities and making sure that they have the appropriate PPE, supplies um, are really trying to connect the Virginia Department of Health to all of our service providers in the community. In addition to that outreach, I would say in reach and outreach, we are really boots on the ground. Um, this is a picture of our Henrico and Chickahominy MRC units canvassing an entire neighborhood. We've identified some areas where there's community members that don't have good accessibility to testing, and so we are trying to encourage them to obtain testing. And one of the ways we've done that is actually walk neighborhoods, hand out flyers, have conversations with individuals, and answer questions. And so you are our public health champions, and hopefully will be a part of helping us to spread our COVID-19 message about obtaining uh, testing, getting vaccinated, covering your cough, and washing your hands, all of those are very important strategies to mitigate and prevent the um, widespread transmission of COVID-19. We do have some limited virtual volunteer opportunities that we always get questions about, so I wanted to make sure to cover those because perhaps walking your, your local neighborhood isn't possible for you. We do have a core team of volunteers right now that is working statewide to do contact investigations for the outbreak on the Eastern Shore. And they'll be doing that for several months. We have our volunteers who are doing facility PPE surveying. We have a team of volunteers that are mental health resiliency teams that are developing messaging, calling volunteers after deployment, and identifying training that would be helpful post and pre-deployment for volunteers and our VDH staff. There are a lot of opportunities for online training, and this is a great time to be able to knock those out. I'll uh, share those with you here in just a bit. 
some of our MRC unit coordinators could really use some help in the Virginia volunteer health system. Our Fairfax MRC has gotten over 900 new volunteer applications since March the 1st. Wow, that's a lot of people to process. You might be one of those. And if you're interested and very tech savvy, you'd be interested and willing to help your MRC unit coordinator. I'm sure they would love the extra hands-on support and that can be done from your home. We do have a social media team as well that helps to post information on our Facebook pages and does some monitoring of social media outlets and provides um, information. At our local health departments right now, as we continue to provide essential services and open up for perhaps some more essential services, we have volunteers that are doing screenings um, at our health department facilities. So they are meeting um, the individuals coming in at the door, um, providing information, um, providing masks, if they don't have masks, taking temperatures. Um, and really making sure that the people that come into our facilities are healthy. And this is, of course, really important. Another aspect of the use of PPE is actually to do PPE fit testing and to do donning and doffing. Um, we have uh, volunteers that will be working actually next week for our May elections, and they are gonna be our um, public health infection prevention ambassadors. And they'll be at polling locations encouraging, uh, encouraging community members to maintain that six foot distancing and to use masks and proper sanitation of the polling location. So we do outreach for donning and doffing, but we also make, go around and make sure our long-term care facilities can properly use PPE, as well as making sure all of our health department and medical reserve corps volunteers are properly fitted for our N95 masks. Here is a picture of two volunteers being fitted by our public health emergency coordinators. Um, there's a specific hood that you have to use and um, solution to make sure that the mask is properly sealed to your face, and this is very important. We certainly want to make sure that you have the appropriate PPE to prevent you from um, getting COVID-19. And this specific PPE um, effort pictured here was done for a drive-through point of testing event. This was very early on. This picture was from our first point of testing event in Henrico and Chickahominy and people drove through, there were multiple tents, um, and it was a well-coordinated effort with multiple organizations, but 80% of the staff for this effort was Medical Reserve Corps volunteers. In addition to tents, we now, with great beautiful weather, have open air <laughs> point of testing sites. Um, here are some students from Virginia Tech, who are providing point of testing um, drive through without tents. And we'll be exploring creative ways for us to provide testing to community members. So let's take a little bit of a shift um, and look at right now our largest outbreak um, community um, facilities that we have in our communities. And that's long term care facilities. So, you know, as we talked of that vulnerable population earlier, the greatest number of residents at our long-term care facilities are all vulnerable populations. We have a significant number of outbreaks and deaths in our long-term care facilities. And with that, um, we have been doing point prevalence testing to go in and test all of the residents and the staff members at these facilities. After doing so, um, often the facilities experience a shortage in staffing and it's quite critical. Perhaps the staff have to work multiple jobs and when you work in long-term care facilities, you have to be committed to working in one location. And so we have been mobilizing volunteers to support long-term care facilities around the state for well over four weeks now. And we do make sure that volunteers have the appropriate PPE, but our priority is to mobilize the volunteers to serve in areas where there are not COVID-19 positive patients. Although, you know, we truly can't guarantee um, that others are not because they can be asymptomatic um, for up to 48 hours prior to showing symptoms for COVID-19. 
This will continue to be a large part of our medical surge response efforts, um, not only now, but um, perhaps in the fall as we look at other spreads of communicable diseases in these facilities such as flu and norovirus, which occurs every fall. Um, we certainly hope that we learn a lot from our current outbreaks so that we can prevent um, significant outbreaks in the fall. And I imagine that we'll still need to use some MRC volunteers to fill some critical gaps in staffing um, so that we can be, um, be able to maintain support to the patients that are in those facilities. Our other medical surge um, effort has not occurred yet, although we are having a lot of planning um, efforts to look at deploying volunteers to support alternate care facilities. This picture is of volunteers at a, um, a STIP tent, um, uh, stabilized treatment um, in place. Uh, we actually set up mobile EDs for our rock and roll and shamrock marathons in Virginia Beach. Our volunteers are integrated and work alongside our public, um, not our public health, but our hospital staff, our Centera hospital staff, to provide care to patients in this facility. Um, but also along the race route. In one year, we actually looked and we mobilized that alternate care facility site, not only in tents, but also in another Centera facility. And you can see here, our Medical Reserve Corps volunteers is working with another Centera staff member to provide care to this patient. More than likely, um, if we experience a large peak and a second surge, we will be using volunteers to augment our hospital staff. May not be providing direct care to COVID patients, but maybe backfilling in other areas. Not too sure if we'll set up the three alternate care sites in the convention centers that we've identified. Certainly we hope not, because that is a worst case scenario, but we like to and need to prepare for the worst and certainly hope for the best. In the future, when we get vaccination, we will all be very excited to get vaccination. We will be doing mass vaccination efforts. Actually, the picture of the long line here is from uh, H1N1 um, vaccination efforts um, in 2010. We do practice every year um, with annual flu vaccine, the ability to do that point of dispensing, point of vaccination in our communities. Picture here is um, our wonderful volunteer, Robin Booth, who's a registered nurse, and this is in Portsmouth. Um, they do this mass vaccination clinic behind a, a community college, and you can drive through, stay in your car, and get your shot in the arm. I do this every year. They actually time how long it takes. I think it took me maybe 20 minutes to drive through this year. And all of the different vaccination tents that are along um, in this uh, clinic are all staffed by Medical Reserve Corps volunteers. In addition to the tents out in the community, open air, we also have done where you can drive through and the location is actually in a rescue squad. So um, we're a little bit, we will do vaccinations <laughs> at many places come the fall. Um, it might be a community center here that's just pictured in Fairfax County for H1N1. Um, and we'll use it as an opportunity to try to, um, you know, create as much immunity in our community um, as possible. In addition to, of course, providing the vaccinations, um, we have volunteers that are willing to be those public health champions and get the message out. Um, smiling faces of greeting and encouraging and handing out information um, is a critical part in encouraging people to get vaccinated. That's really what we have on the plate right now. Um, I certainly didn't think that at the beginning of our COVID response efforts um, at the early part of March that in May we would be deploying volunteers to long-term care facilities but that has been um, identified me. So we'll continue to question how will we utilize our volunteers? How can we best mobilize wonderful individuals like yourself to support our communities? And the reason why we need volunteers is because we do have a limited workforce. As I mentioned, some of our workforce has to quarantine perhaps for two weeks, 
because they um, have contracted COVID-19, but also our public health workforce is really limited. So we need volunteers that can backfill our epidemiologists and um, support our MRC unit coordinators and to help even support our essential services in maybe the WIC clinics. Um, we still have to maintain our mission and public health, daily public health, in addition to responding to COVID-19. We are fortunate that you have skills and experience that we may not have in public health um, that we can harness and utilize um, to be able to support this effort. Um, volunteers are incredibly caring about their community. I um, say that my quote is never underestimate the willingness of a volunteer. Uh, I'm constantly amazed by the willingness for community members to do whatever it takes to help someone else. Um, we have volunteers that are driving all the way from Newport News an hour and a half all the way up the Eastern Shore to work a long-term care facility. And I just think that is a great testament to the caring um, nature of our volunteers. And we need that expanding capacity. Pictured here are volunteers from our sesquicentennial celebration of the Battle of Bull Run deployment, where we staffed 10 medical tents. And as you can see, we had basically three different um, types of roles that volunteers were filling. Our first aid role um, was filled sometimes by non-medical volunteers who completed first aid. We had our registered nurses that were helping with hydration and working with our EMS providers. And we had supervisors. And those supervisors didn't necessarily have medical um, credentials. And so everybody is needed um, to help put together our testing tents, to help setting up tents, to help moving tables. Um, there's a lot of um, operations that are going to have to occur in order for us to fulfill our mission to be able to respond to COVID-19. So who is going to be needed um, at any point in time is going to be dependent upon the request we receive and specifically the level of care that is needed. So it is anticipated um, that, of course, we thought we would be utilizing volunteers perhaps for our long-term care facilities, but we're finding that we have a lot of requests now for actual support um, for those facilities, such as um, providing care and feeding to the residents. Um, we have specific requests for a type of volunteer that I had um, experienced previously. And who is needed, needed will be based upon location and their willingness to deploy. Um, we will always focus on trying to deploy volunteers as close to where they live, but obviously there are some areas of our state that have limited resources, and so we've deployed them outside of their public health um, districts. Um, quantity, when and where, um, again, all determined based upon the requests that we receive. And those are formal requests. Um, they come from the localities, from healthcare facilities, and we try to do our best to decipher um, what exactly is needed for us to provide and who is needed and mobilize them um, to serve and, and fulfill that mission. You are now um, going to be a part of a very large group of volunteers that often wear red shirts. Um, and it's awesome to see here, this is the Chesapeake MRC unit. Um, our core of volunteers has grown significantly at the beginning of 2020. We had about 10,000 volunteers. Um, today, uh, just about uh, five and a half months later, we have over 17,600 volunteers. Um, so we've welcomed um, and welcome you uh, to a large core of really fantastic volunteers. And that core consists of healthcare professionals, of course, of many different types. Um, some of our um, response efforts may require the background knowledge of a mental health professional, perhaps performing a task that they wouldn't at their normal day-to-day um, -day job, but perhaps they can help us in the call center and 
um, help to calm the fears of any community members, a little different and outside the box. So we can't say that you'll always be um, responding and helping us in the same way that you do on a day-to-day -day response as a, um, in your job as a healthcare professional, but we definitely will be trying to identify ways that we can use your skills and experience um, in different areas. As I mentioned previously, we do need those non-medical or what we like to call support volunteers. And these um, are our teachers, um, our clergy. We actually had some volunteers deployed to a long-term care facility out in Harrisonburg, um, providing some spiritual support, um, which was really important. Um, we have volunteers that are providing some data analysis for us, IT um, support. Uh, volunteers that help with our ham radio operations. So really there are a lot of different things that we do and I think that there is for the most part a place for everyone at some point in time to be able to volunteer. Let's talk about our expectations now and what's involved in becoming a deployable volunteer. So our expectation is that you do not self-deploy. Um, please do not go unless we tell you that you're needed. Um, we'll need you to complete some core training. We'll need you to respond to alert notifications that you're going to receive in the Virginia Volunteer Health System. I'm going to go over that, um, those specific uh, alert notifications and how to respond here in a few minutes. We need you to be dependable. Certainly understand if you uh, something comes up or if you're ill and not available um, that you can't um, show up, that you please let your MRC unit coordinator know. Uh, I need you to maintain your current information. You know, um, we require you just that you're committed, that when you show up, you're committed to be there. And that you're always representing the MRC when you're putting on your red shirt um, and, and showing up to any event. So I can't emphasize more, put it in bold, italics, and red. Do not respond to any emergency, do not respond to any event unless you're requested and officially deployed by your MRC coordinator. Um, this is important for liability coverage because only when volunteers are under the direction of the Virginia Department of Health does the state liability coverage um, apply. Um, when we go and deploy other facilities, such as hospitals or long-term care facilities for medical search, the liability coverage will then come from those um, facilities. So we need to have a good accounting of where you are and who's responsible for you so that we can make sure that you um, have the coverage needed. Because we're wearing red shirts um, and participating in events um, and COVID-19 is very high profile, I'm sure, as you know, if you watch the television very often. Um, we are approached very frequently by the press for information about um, who we are and what we're doing, and we're more than happy to engage in informing them about the Medical Reserve Corps. But we ask that we, if you are approached by the press, that if you're at a facility, you're working at one of our point of testing sites, that you immediately notify the point of information officer and allow them to coordinate any interview. If you're not on site with a public information officer, definitely contact your MRC unit coordinator. When in doubt, ask. Um, we have been able to facilitate some opportunities for our volunteers and MRC coordinators to be on national news, um, to definitely be highlighted in local news um, in their communities. And, we appreciate everyone's opportunity. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to do that and everybody being willing to do those interviews. When you um, completed your application um, to become a volunteer, there was a HIPAA and liability coverage acknowledgement form. Um, that form is actually posted on the orientation page where you received the link for this. Um, presentation. If you just go down to the bottom, it's right above any of your handbooks for your MRC units. Um, so, you know, as a volunteer, you're expected to maintain and protect the health information of any of our patients or clients um, that we um, interact with. Additionally, um, as I mentioned previously, we do have um, fairly comprehensive liability coverage when volunteers are under the direction of the Virginia Department of Health. 
actually additional coverage um, has been provided um, by one of the executive orders that has been assigned by our governor as well. So um, you have that coverage. We do not have workers compensation coverage for volunteers. Um, actually COVID-19 is not considered as one of the things that workers compensation will cover um, even if the coverage is provided. So who has access to your information? Well, your information is managed by MRC unit coordinators, both the local coordinators and our regional MRC unit coordinators. Our public health emergency coordinators and our support staff in the Virginia Volunteer Health System and my staff and, and myself as the state volunteer coordinator all have access to your information, but we take um, very uh, seriously um, need to maintain um, your privacy. We don't send out emails with your email address included in it. And we only share your information with people that need to know it for deployment. So you, whether or not you have a license, whether or not you have a current CPR certification, that's only shared as needed for your deployment. That's kind of our base on the policies and procedures. Let's talk about responsibilities for preparing to respond now. Um, you're gonna learn a lot, um, not only responding, but before responding to an emergency. And we do have a wonderful tool, learning management system that we utilize to, um, to provide online training. And that's the Train Virginia. Um, it is a resource that not only has Virginia training, but has training provided by the CDC and FEMA, um, a lot of different um, universities, so it is a collection. Um, what is great about training is it provides you um, train. It provides you with a lot of um, resources, perhaps for training that you don't have access to. And if you're interested in professionally pursuing a public health career, um, this will be a great way for you to get a start and learn a lot more. You certainly can take any training that's on train, um, and we do have some training requirements for our specific teams. The good thing is, is that we, there are several trainings that do have CEUs, if that's something that would be beneficial to you. Make sure that you scroll down to the bottom of your screen um, when you look at those trainings and it'll tell you how many CEUs are offered and what logistical um, registration requirements are required for you to have those CEUs. You'll always have access to your training records either in TRAIN or in the Virginia Volunteer Health System. And then you can go directly from TRAIN um, to, you can go directly from VVHS to your TRAIN account. What we don't want you to do is to create a new TRAIN account. I, you don't have one previously before becoming a medical reserve corps volunteer, then once your application is approved, a train account will be created for you. I'll talk a little bit about how to log on in just a minute. So the training that you'll need to complete now um, is our incident command system, a national incident management system. There are a lot of acronyms, so it's ICS and NIMS. Um, our Introduction to Mental Health Preparedness, or our Psychological First Aid courses. Um, and then we have some courses for epidemiology and public health, and they're all listed on this website. Um, we have just a base training page, and it tells you about how to log in to your account for train, um, how to reset your password, and then have links to these specific courses. When you log in to your account in BDHS, you'll come over to the training tab. And on the training tab, you can see all the way to the right, there's a button that says log in to train Virginia. If you click on that button, it'll take you directly to, to train. If your MRC unit isn't correct on this page, you can also choose to change your MRC unit. And actually your FEMA student ID number um, is not done through the Virginia on volunteer health system or train. You'll have to go to the FEMA website, obtain your training ID number, and then log back into train and put it into train. And um, you can click on the find um, more information about volunteer training and then I'll take you back to our training page. So how are you activated and what does it look like to be a volunteer in the Virginia um, Medical Reserve Corps? 
Well, when you're activated, you're going to be working with a lot of different partners. And that's the reason for some of the training is that we all have the same base knowledge um, about emergency response. So here pictured is some of our volunteers that deployed to the inauguration um, and worked alongside our public health. Um, officers as well as our disaster medical assistance team members and the National Park Service. So we truly integrate when we respond and be a part of the team. Our activation for um, our responses are, as I mentioned previously, dependent upon our requests. So we're not going to be sending out an alert for you in VBHS if someone hasn't told us that we potentially could need your support. You'll receive the alert through VVHS and sometimes be requested to sign up for a shift. I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. And then you'll receive some additional instructions, perhaps from your local or regional deployment coordinator. So that alert notification can be issued um, for a lot of different event um, activities, not only for COVID-19 response, but for community outreach events perhaps special in-person training. We do monthly notification drills. There are grant requirements. And then for emergencies, such as supporting those shelters. If you don't respond, I want to tell you, you might get the same alert again. The coordinators have a little magic button um, that allows them to resend the alert to people that haven't responded. So um, really, just click on yes, I'm available, or no, I'm not available, and you won't receive multiple text messages or emails or phone calls. The classifications of those alert notifications are listed here. So typically a communication is just to let you know about something. Um, it's a newsletter, it's an update, it might be some details about deployment, um, logistics of where you need to go to pick up something. Uh, our awareness is a heads up, um, perhaps, hey, it's hurricane season, we want to go ahead and develop our, um, our shelter response team. Readiness, I need to know if we do receive this alert, if you would be available. Um, and that helps us to gauge whether or not we can fulfill the request that we have received. We'll send an activation alert once we've committed and we need to specifically mobilize you. And often, right now, our coordinators are using our emergency status. Um, and we use that when we really need a response um, from you within 24 hours, we use the emergency alert classification. And our deactivation alerts will be sent when we stand down, and they'll probably have details about um, doing a post-deployment survey and resources for mental health um, recovery. We're now going to take a step and look into the Virginia Volunteer Health System. You can go to VBHS from our VAMRC.org page. Um, you want the shortcut to take you directly there, you go to uh, backslash VBHS. So when you come to this page, what we do not want you to do is we do not want you to go to that blue button over there that says register as a new volunteer because you've already done that. I want you to go to the right hand side of the screen and type in your username and your password where it says please sign in and then click the sign in button. If you have trouble logging in, you can click the trouble logging in button and it'll open up a page where you can reset your password, you can have your user I name, um, username sent, or um, have your security questions sent. If for some reason perhaps your email address has changed from when you first completed your application, of course, you'll have difficulty in receiving that notification. Um, so you can use the contact button and send an email to VAMRC at vdh.virginia.gov. And um, one of our great staff members there will help walk you through the um, process to get your logs back in. Your dashboard, when you log in, has some basic information. Um, you'll see to the left-hand side, um, you can log in to look at alerts. You can look at the different deployments that have you have done. Um, you can't enter your deployments. Your deployments are entered by your MRC unit coordinator. And you can also download a training report. If you go to the right-hand side, that is the My Account button. And it'll come to you, your, um, this is what your actual profile looks like. 
Um, so it gives you information about how well you have responded to an alert. It has a picture of you. Um, Robin Booth is our superstar volunteer, so I put um, a star for her. You can see she's deployed 49 times. She's received 204 deployments, 204 alerts, and she responds 77% of the time. On this page, it also tells us that um, you're a registered nurse. Um, and we look at this information about you when we log into the system. When you hit click, um, connect, you click on the My Account button, you can come over and access um, many of the different sections of your application that you did when you first completed your application. So for say maybe you needed to add a secondary email or provide some additional information about your credentials, it's pretty easy to do so. Over to the right, you see our arrow and it has the edit button. Anytime there's an edit button, you can come in and make changes to that information. That page will open up and you can make your edits. Now, you cannot change the MRC unit. Once you, your application is approved, you cannot change which MRC unit you um, selected to serve. If you need to do that, please let your MRC unit coordinator know, or you can send an email to vimrc at vdh.virginia.gov and we'd be happy to make that transfer. Birth date, um, your gender and your race, because all of um, those data elements are used to um, submit your background investigation information. If you have a common name, your MRC unit coordinator may be reaching out to you to obtain your social security number so we can run um, the background investigation, but we do not maintain that information in the Virginia Volunteer Health System. A very important aspect, if you scroll down on that page, um, is your phone and text alert section. This is how you're receiving your alerts in VBHS. So more than likely, um, you don't really want to receive text messages to your home phone. So make sure where you can make the selections for both phone or text, you only have it as phone. Um, for your cell phone, we definitely recommend that you get text messages. You know, you never know sometimes with email that your email provider might block an email as spam. Um, so our backup is text messages. We do use that and tell you that we've sent you an, an alert and that we need you to respond. So please make sure that anytime you get a new email, you um, get a new phone number, that you come back into your, um, into your profile and update your information. As you can imagine, maintaining a contact list of over 17,000 volunteers takes quite an effort. So if you can help us, we would greatly appreciate it. We also maintain your certifications in the Virginia Volunteer Health System. That includes your driver's license and your healthcare information, your CPR certification, um, and any other certifications that you have. Perhaps if you're a pharmacist, you have a certification for being able to vaccinate. Um, you can enter all that information here on this page. We've actually, um, since I took this screenshot, added the section for you to be able to upload that um, your copies. If you take a picture of your driver's license, you can upload that. It's actually pretty helpful for us because it provides us with another piece of information that identifies who you are. So completing all of this section will allow us to contact you and to identify what um, qualifications you have for volunteering. So when you get that alert, this is how you're going to respond. For our email, you will get an email that's addressed specifically to you. This email was sent by the MRC unit coordinator to let the volunteer know that there was a need for volunteers for Special Olympics. This is one of those regular ongoing public health activities that we do to provide screening and education to athletes. And um, usually that's just a little summary that tells you the gist of what the alert is. And once you click the link, it'll open up and it'll provide you with more information of what, when, how um, to respond. So this was an alert notification to all the volunteers that hadn't completed the alert. 
You'll notice at the time the coordinator was directing volunteers to go to train to register for the training and also providing links to that um, incident um, command system training and that national incident management training, the IS-100 and IS-700. If you would um, be available for supporting any type of alert notification like this, you would just come down to the bottom and click I'm available for this event. If you're not, it would be definitely helpful for us to know to choose the I'm not available for this event alert option. We are now staffing for multiple, um, multiple shifts and sometimes multiple locations. And you'll see um, alert messages that will perhaps maybe even have 10 to 15 options. Um, providing these options to you um, really helps us manage and uh, eliminate a lot of the phone calls and emails um, that we need to do in order to roster and deploy volunteers. So if you are available, you can come over to the left and click that little box that says available. And that lets us know that you're available for that shift. Um, and then you come down and click the blue button that says, I'm available for the selective event. Now, at any point in time, as long as the alert is open, you can come back into this email and change your selection. Um, it's definitely helpful if you let your coordinator know, but sometimes we just leave these alerts open. So if they, you get an, a, a text and a phone call, um, on a Friday night and you're out and don't have access to the email on your phone, then when you get back home, if you were on travel and you got home on Saturday morning, you can still respond to the alert. Um, and if you did it via your phone and for some reason life circumstances changed, um, that's okay. You can just come in and, and check on not available. Your MRC unit coordinator can help you manage that as well if you have any technical difficulties. So other than the email selections like that, um, you can or will get a phone call sometimes if the coordinators decide to send you a phone call. That'll give you the option to select one if you're available or two if you're not available. But if that alert includes multiple locations and shifts, you won't be able to choose available via the phone. It's gonna tell you to be sure to check your, your email to select your availability. Now, if you would, please take a moment to write down the phone number on the screen, 804-864-7200. That is the phone number that will be calling you um, with your alert messages. So saving it in your contacts, maybe putting it as MRC alert, um, then that'll, that'll notify you when you're getting your alert um, notifications from VVHS. I'm actually copied on every single phone alert that comes out um, to all the volunteers. And right now, um, that's probably at least eight alert phone messages that go out today, and I probably combined well over 15 a day. So we are very much utilizing VVHS to communicate with all the volunteers that are needed. I know that you signed up and you're really excited about volunteering, and we're excited that you're here too. Um, and you are ready to raise your hand and say that you're available and click on that I'm available link. Before you do that, I would like for you to take a, a few minutes to consider if you're actually qualified for the request. Um, we provide as much details as possible. Um, if perhaps you have some questions about your qualifications, then you certainly can reach out to your coordinator. Check whether or not um, you're personally, physically, emotionally ready um, to deploy, perhaps um, you know, you're kind of stressed um, and you have some things going on with your family, then maybe right now um, wouldn't be the right time. But you want to assess that you can make the commitment. Maybe the commitment is for a 12 hour shift. Um, the commitment is for multiple days. Um, we want to make sure that you can do that commitment. Now, not always. Um, you have to make sure you're right for the request. So, understanding the nature of the request. And then whether or not you can practice within best standards and within your training and experience. This is um, especially for not only COVID-19, but say when we deployed volunteers to North Carolina um, to support shelter operations for Hurricane Florence. Um, that was a pretty stressful um, situation and it was in very austere um, living conditions. So 
staying in cots and in large areas. Um, maybe if you had a bad back, it would not have been the right deployment for you because they drove um, a lot for that event. We actually had volunteers that uh, were transported via helicopter. Um, so sometimes the requests are pretty calm and sometimes they're a little more adventurous and certainly not every volunteer is the right fit for that. So definitely make sure that um, you know, you're, you're ready for the nature of that request. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's just right now, a point in time in your life that um, it's, it's too close, maybe personally, to what has gone on. Maybe you've had a family member who has passed away recently, um, you know, and or maybe your life events are just very chaotic. Uh, you have someone who um, is a, a high risk um, and is living with somebody that has COVID-19 and you're very concerned about them. You know, maybe it's just not the right time. We really want you to take a break too. Um, you know, we don't want you to go and work every week and not um, take some time off. It's really important that we maintain balance. Now I wanna share some of the specific considerations um, for volunteers in working in our COVID-19 um, patients and directly. So when we have, um, we provide all the PPE, but we always have to know and recognize that there is always a risk of exposure. Um, we do our best with our donning and doffing um, using our PPE, but the risk is always there. You may need to um, self-quarantine um, at home um, if you become ill, isolate away from your family members. So you'll want to consider whether or not the potential exposure of maybe someone that lives in your home, um, if you were to get sick, is the right thing to be doing for everyone's health. Um, if you have direct contact with um, patients, it's recommended that really you quarantine for two weeks after that deployment um, or are working in any facility with the COVID-19 patients and you cannot work from one facility um, and then directly go and work for another facility. Um, you cannot work for two facilities at the same time. So certainly with that in mind, it definitely limits our workforce. Um, and when we talk about the long-term care facilities, often a lot of those providers that are in those facilities um, work multiple jobs. So that's the reason for our shortage of staff there. So after you've made all of those considerations, we want you to know that it is okay to say no. Um, we certainly um, recognize you are a volunteer and um, we want you to feel comfortable that even though you're committed to responding and you really wanna be there, um, that it is um, voluntary. I know sometimes it says, you know, we're the core and you know, although that sounds a little bit like um, a military commitment, it's, it's not. Um, when you do go, we want you to represent the MRC, wear your red shirt, um, your identification badge, and your lanyard, um, that you follow all of the instructions provided. Um, we definitely need to make sure you sign in and sign out to document hours. We actually, in some um, MRC units across the state, just launched the ability to log in via a link, a survey. So we have volunteers that are gonna be working the polling locations on Tuesday and they'll be checking in and checking out via a link that they receive via a text message. So we're going virtual with that as well. Um, hopefully you'll get job action sheets and you'll receive some just-in-time training. And always um, wear the appropriate PPE and make sure that you have been properly fit tested for that PPE. Now, sometimes we go, sometimes we hurry up, and sometimes we have to wait. I <laughs> know we're really excited, but we have to be flexible. Some for gone by, um, and because um, things change constantly in emergencies. Um, really, what happens today um, might be changed tomorrow, and those requests will flex, um, and may be needed or not needed. Um, our work is very rewarding, um, but it's stressful and it is tiring. Um, sometimes we have to step outside the box and maybe do things that we hadn't thought we would be doing um, because you know we just have to um, all be on a team together. And certainly the benefit 
of being a Medical Corps Reserve Corps volunteer is that you are on a great um, large team of your community members that are really dedicated and willing to help others. And um, often our volunteers um, build um, great lifelong friendships. We have a lot of students that get to um, be mentored by some of our retired healthcare professionals. Um, and you really have that opportunity to know that you've made a difference in the community. So throughout our presentation, we have reviewed a lot, and that's included our um, purpose and mission for our Medical Reserve Corps, um, our overview of our emergency response efforts for COVID-19, your response roles um, and responsibilities and the protocols for our response efforts. We talked about Train Virginia and the Virginia Volunteer Health System, and now let's look at those next steps. So your application is approved. Um, you are working, um, we're working through the background investigation process. Um, with that, uh, you'll be getting, after that, you'll be getting your identification. Um, we have some COVID-19 Virginia MRC t-shirts. You'll be getting the badge and lanyard. Um, you'll need to go in and complete that online training. And then you'll be mobilized for responses um, as requests are made. Um, we might get a lot of requests initially, um, maybe not so for a little while, and then more again. So just be um, waiting for those notifications and then for you to be demobilized um, and be ready for our next response. Most importantly, um, we want to thank you. Um, thank you for stepping up, um, for choosing to be a volunteer um, for the Virginia Medical Reserve Corps for choosing to protect the health of the citizens of the Commonwealth. I can't even begin to tell you um, how amazed we are at how many people have um, been willing to become Medical Reserve Corps volunteers since our state health commissioner, Dr. Oliver, has made the call out as well as our governor, Dr. Um, Nor Northam. Um, this has been a tremendous response. And you have now completed the orientation but don't go yet, we need to take a roll call. And the roll call for that involves you sending an email. You know, we're doing virtually, although I'd like to say hi out there, everybody. Um, we need for you to check in and we need for you to send an email to training at vamrc.org and say, I attended orientation, Virginia MRC rocks. You can put that in the subject line if you'd like, be sure to include your first and last name in that email, and we'll make sure the orientation is documented and your profile in the Virginia Volunteer Health System, and that your volunteer knows that you've completed the orientation. So that's the last thing that you have to do um, to have your orientation completed, and we thank you for joining us for this session.